Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Yuan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and that's a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. I'm very pleased to welcome our guest and my very good friend, Matt Moran, founder of Moran Innovation and a true rocket scientist. Matt worked for 31 years at NASA developing power and propulsion systems, including first of kind liquid slush, I didn't know they had slush hydrogen, and gaseous hydrogen systems. He recently designed the zero boil off system for the world's largest liquid hydrogen tank at the Kennedy Space Center. And it holds 1.25 million, that's with an M, gallons of liquid hydrogen. We're gonna be talking story today about hydrogen, myths and facts, moving beyond the hydrogen fairy tales. Matt, welcome to the show. Aloha, thanks for having me back. And let's throw up this work of art that Matt created, <laughs> especially for this show. He never had, he never knew he had it in him that he's now a budding artist. This is an awesome little piece of artwork. Matt, uh, do you wanna, I think it uh, goes over all your slides. It's like a, it's a, uh, a uh, compendium of the slides we're going to be looking at. Do you, do you want to start off a little bit about myths and uh, yes, uh, fairy sure. tales? Uh, so uh, I know you like mind map, Mitch. So this is a little bit of a, a, an unstructured mind map, but a, but a brief uh, sketch of each of the topics that I thought we could chat about. Uh, and these are all pretty common. Um, uh, I'm calling them myths, but they're misconceptions generally that uh, many folks have about hydrogen in a few cases even some authoritative organizations, both domestic and international, that uh, are still uh, have some facts and misconceptions related to liquid hydrogen in particular. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about those with you and your audience today. Yeah, it's amazing. You and I have gone through several of these reports and, you know, don't they get the word? Like, it doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to steal your thunder on the show and tell people what it is, but, you know, it's Please unbelievable do. that they still haven't got it. So let's get on to the first slide. Let's uh, talk about the uh, hydrogen safety because that's always a concern with people. And there's a lot of myths about hydrogen safety. So lead off, Matt. Yes, uh, as you said, Mitch, and uh, you know, it's hard to avoid the topic of the uh, dirigible that's now 75 year old black and white movie. Uh, there's <laughs> right. a lot that can be said about that. Uh, uh, but the most important thing is it had very highly flammable skin uh, on it, uh, and uh, hydrogen, as you know, in daylight is invisible uh, to uh, conventional cameras in the eye, and it rises at 20 meters per second in ambient air. So, uh, within a first second or two of that uh, black and white frame, there were no, there was no hydrogen left. It was all gone and high up in the atmosphere. So you're watching the skin of a, of a balloon, basically, or a dirigible, uh, burning uh, for the rest of that film. But people think about that. Uh, what, what a lot of folks don't realize is that there's been large scale uh, hydrogen systems, particularly liquid hydrogen systems, operating safely uh, over the last 60 years continuously in the space program. And that's ground systems, uh, fueling uh, of vehicles, launch missions, uh, the, the whole nine yards. Uh, so uh, that's a big piece, I think, uh, that, that uh, needs to get out there in terms of communicating that uh, these, these systems have been in place for many, many decades. Uh, and there's lots of standards and guidelines in the safe usage of them. Uh, the no, second bullet, that, oh, go ahead, Mitch. Sorry. Oh, no, you go ahead. I was just going to say the uh, the second bullet there is actually a more recent bit of information. Uh, uh, the Army did testing with the uh, armor piercing ammunition on a composite overwrap pressure vessel, 700 bar pressure. That's about 10,000 PSI in, in uh, U.S. customary units. Uh, and that was uh, gaseous hydrogen. Uh, and all their testing, uh, there was no ignition. Uh, the, uh, when they made the hole into the, the uh, vessel, the um, hydrogen escaped without uh, any safety concerns and, and emptied itself out. So uh, just another example, you know, if you think about the fire triangle, uh, you have to have a fuel ignition source and an oxidizer. And a key part of that or the caveat is they all have to be in the same place at the same time. So that rise rate of hydrogen is a big uh, key to that, even though hydrogen has a, a fairly wide flammability range, 
uh, it rises so fast in air that it's it's gone most of the time when when uh, you know once the ignition starts. So um, that that bit of testing, I think, is is another piece that most people aren't aware of. Uh, and, and again, if you if you compare that to, to some of the legacy fuels, the same sort of tests, uh, armor piercing uh, uh, ammunition, I don't think anybody would want to be very close to that uh, situation. So. Uh, or lithium ion batteries for that matter. And I drive an electric vehicle. I've been driving one for uh, almost a year and a half now. Uh, but if uh, if I thought there was any uh, compromise of that battery casing, I'd get out, away from it very quickly because there's nothing you can do uh, once you've pierced that uh, yeah. that battery pack and you get a thermal runaway situation. That I just, you know, pretty much a smoldering mass is all you have left after a while. There's really not much you can do to stop it. And you can't put it up. I mean, they put thousands and thousands of gallons on it. It might go out for a little, a few minutes, and then it reignites. But I also want to uh, clarify something. When you talk about 20 meters per second, that's actually 66 feet per second. So if you say 1,001, and you've released that molecule, it's already a six stories, seven stories yes. up. I mean, imagine yes. how fast that is. 1,001 has gone up seven stories. Tremendously oh, rapid. Like, yeah, yes. it's unbelievable. And that's not under pressure. If you had that's it in right. a tank that's pressurized, it's actually shooting it up like a gun. So it's going probably the speed of sound going up. It's going so fast. That's an excellent point. And, and that's the way most vent systems are designed, of course, for hydrogen systems is to shoot, you know, point them up upwards. So you're right. It's going to have momentum in addition to that natural buoyancy, which is already very rapid. And even with the case of liquid hydrogen, it vaporizes very quickly and uh, it begins that rapid ascent as well. So you don't have pools of fuel laying around or, or starting to spread or, or ignite it as you do with legacy fossil fuels. It's uh, even with the liquid hydrogen, it, it'll stick around for a little while, but it, within a few seconds, it'll warm up and start to uh, start to rise very quickly as well. So uh, a couple of other points that uh, my friend Stan Osterman made. First of all, you know, they coated the Hindenburg with rocket fuel, basically powdered aluminum, yeah, which right. is what they use in solid state rockets. So, right. wow, that was a really good move. Bad, and, bad uh, idea. Yes, bad especially idea. with electrostatic problems you have with uh, weather and, and dirigibles, which they knew fairly well at that time. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of, I think, bad decisions made in terms of uh, the operation of that uh, particular mission or, or, or flight to that uh, dirigible. And the other thing Stan reminded me of was you know, when that hydrogen escaped, it was going up really fast and it brought the heat with it. So instead of the heat going down below amongst the passengers, the heat escaped very quickly yes. above the Hindenburg. And that's why so many people actually got away, uh, got uh, away alive and survived. That's a good point. Yeah, it's pulling a lot of that up. Yeah, the, the latest thing I tell people that bring it up is if, if that had been filled with helium or hot air, it doesn't matter what the lifting gas was, you would have seen the same footage. It really had nothing to do with the hydrogen. But again, you know, this is what's stuck in people's heads. So you have to address it, particularly when you're talking with a, a public, uh, you know, a, a, a public group or a group that doesn't have a lot of experience, which is most people with hydrogen systems. So, And that's what we're trying to do on this show, myths and fairy tales. Right. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Another yeah. beautiful work of art, I must say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is another a, a, a bit of a myth, I guess. Uh, you'll you'll occasionally, or maybe more more than occasionally, hear uh, comments about uh, liquid hydrogen, in particular, being kind of a far off vision or something that will take many years to, to implement. Uh, the fact of the matter is that um, the liquid hydrogen uh, li jet engine was developed in the 1950s and successful, uh, dozens of successful flights with a liquid hydrogen fueled aircraft with a jet engine was done in the 1950s. And then in the 1960s, the first launch of a rocket with liquid hydrogen uh, occurred. And every year since then, there's been successful liquid hydrogen uh, launch vehicles, not just in the U.S., but across the globe. Uh, Europe, uh, you know, China, Japan, uh, all have liquid hydrogen um, launch vehicles. So for the last uh, 60 plus years, uh, that was the continuous use I was mentioning. Uh, you've got everything from production to storage of, of liquid hydrogen to, uh, you know, long term uh, or long term storage and transfer into the vehicle and usage. It's all available. The technologies really are well developed uh, and well known. And the supply chain is there. 
it's just uh, very concentrated in the space industry currently. So there, and that's changing, of course, very rapidly now as more applications are looking at this. Um, but but there's really no true technology gap. There's certainly enhancing technologies that will improve the economics and the performance. But in terms of actually enabling it, uh, there there's no gaps currently uh, in liquid hydrogen to transition into just about any of the areas that are currently being looked at. And of course, then you know you and I have chatted about this. Um, uh, what, what's really needed right now is capital investments, and that's happening very rapidly and has been happening over the last year or two in a, at a quick pace. But in, in conjunction with that, and this has been a focus I've been, I've been working on, and I know you and I have talked about this, uh, there's a real need for workforce training and, and getting the skill sets required to handle this because it is new to so many industries and, and so many folks. So I think that's a very important piece of this. And of course, public policy and incentives accelerate this whole transition. And we're also seeing lots of activity, uh, again, internationally in that area. Yeah, personally, I see a great future for liquid hydrogen uh, on the off-road vehicles, for example, mining truck, tractors and agriculture, uh, construction equipment. Uh, really, when you look at uh, the logistics of uh, refilling one of those big, huge tractors or trucks, with uh, gaseous hydrogen, you'd have to have like two or three tube trailers lined up to be able to refuel one of those big guys. And uh, yes. they haven't got the time to do it. It would take them hours to refuel uh, up to the level they want. I mean, imagine trying to transfer 500 kilograms or like 500 gallons or 1,000 gallons of uh, liquid or hydrogen equivalent into one of these big mining trucks. It takes forever, and that's time is money for these guys. They got to keep yeah, yeah. that truck going. Absolutely. And I think those kind of use cases, like you said, Mitch, uh, especially, you know, infrastructure is probably one of the biggest challenges with hydrogen. So if you have yeah. use cases where a vehicle is coming and going back and forth between uh, central locations or distributed locations where it's, it's the same uh, end and beginning point, uh, it starts to, to, to pencil out a lot better in terms of the economics because you can set up that infrastructure at those endpoints, the beginning and starting points or, or the centralized location. And now the infrastructure problem is uh, more or less solved for that particular use case. So I think you're right. I think those kinds of, uh, those will be the first, I guess, uh, adopters is, is, are those kinds of uh, use cases where liquid hydrogen really gives a, a, a big performance benefit. Yeah, exactly. So let's move on to some, another set of myths about hydrogen leaks and materials. Uh, this one is uh, is interesting because you know a lot of these I I start, I start to call zombie myths because they just keep they never die. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many times you you try to cut them off at the at the head or whatever. But uh, one of them is uh, this idea that uh, hydrogen is a small molecule and it'll leak through anything, which is is just nonsense. I I, I, I probably should pick a better <laughs> new word for it, but but that's what it is. Uh, you know, there's uh, established design methods and materials. Uh, one of the things, again, you and I have talked about, and, and this has been demonstrated in multiple places, is uh, uh, these 700 bar uh, compressed hydrogen storage containers have been around for a while. They'll composite over at pressure vessels, and many of them have held pressure without any any uh, uh, change in gauge pressure for over 10 years. So uh, obviously the leakage is, is, is not a problem for a, prop in a properly designed system. And then the materials is another one where people will start to, uh, you know, make uh, remarks or, or, or statements uh, about, you know, oh, you, there's not any materials that can hold in hydrogen, uh, which, again, is just silly. Uh, the 300 series stainless steel and aluminum alloys have been used for decades and decades with uh, hydrogen systems of all types. Now, uh, the main thing you want to avoid, as you know, is uh, carbon steels because that's where the embrittlement uh, can become an issue. And if you're at liquid hydrogen uh, temperature, you want to avoid 400 series stainless because there, it's a uh, um, transition, a uh, uh, ductile to brittle transition is um, above the liquid hydrogen temperature. So, um, but that's that's the caveat with 400 series stainless uh, is fine with gaseous hydrogen, but not liquid. And then Teflon and other steel, steel materials are well known and available for hydrogen. So uh, all of these things have, have really been solved over a very long period of time including, uh, you know, there's almost a cottage in an industry around embrittlement <laughs> sometimes, yeah, I notice. Really. And, you know, for new materials, it's absolutely necessary to, to study them and understand them, particularly the thermoplastics and some of the composites. But for standard materials, uh, this embrittlement problem has been known for, for a long, long time and been characterized. You can go back to reports from the 50s and 60s that are still the basis of the standards and codes 
uh, when it comes to material selection and hydrogen. So uh, again, it's it's just a misconception that folks have that ha haven't really had an experience in this field that uh, you know are, are jumping to conclusions about what you can and can't do with these systems. So let's move on to uh, let's talk about greenhouse gases. <laughs> and uh, this is kind of a complicated uh, yes. drawing, so uh, why don't you uh, help us out with this one and talk about greenhouse gases and what's good and what's not. I am by no means an expert in this field either, but so but I'll tell you what, what I do know and what I've found. Um, these uh, top uh, four here that I show in the text, um, and really the top three are the ones that are getting the most focus. Um, the percentages actually represent uh, those greenhouse gases, you think of it as a pie chart, that, that, those would be the pie chart percentages of each of those greenhouse gases that are currently in the atmosphere. So you have to take a look at that as well as the longevity of these gases uh, in the atmosphere because it varies greatly. You can see from thousands of years, in some cases, to 10 or 100. And then the, the final uh, uh, characteristic that's very important to keep in mind is what's the global warming potential? And uh, over 100 years, it's kind of a common um, uh, legacy or, or length of time that seems to be used to, to, to uh, measure that. So carbon dioxide sort of is the normalized, uh, you know, value of one there, but it's 76%. Oh, uh, of, just, just interrupt you. That's what GWP means, in case you don't know. Yes. Global warming potential. Yes, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. So the, you know, carbon dioxide, which has been obviously the bulk of the focus because there is so much of it in terms of the, the pie chart percentage of it that's in our atmosphere in terms of greenhouse gases. And it has a very long uh, lifetime in our atmosphere. Uh, but methane is sort of under the radar for a lot of folks, and, but it's very pro problematic. And there's a lot of leaks that have been, have been unreported and underreported over the years. And now there's satellite data that's showing just how bad the problem really is. Uh, and it's international. Uh, and, and and one of the issues is it's a much uh, 25 times the uh, global warming potential of carbon dioxide, and it's a fairly high percentage, and that percentage may actually uh, be low because of this underreporting. Now, it doesn't last as long as the, in the atmosphere, only 10 years versus thousands, but again, these are all kind of those trades, like you said, it's a complex issue. Uh, nitrous oxide is, uh, is produced in any combustion process. It's a temperature-related uh, your disassociation of nitrogen and then, I'm sorry, disassociation of oxygen in the atmosphere, and then it re uh, recombines with nitrogen to, to form NOx, uh, uh, often called if you heard people talk about NOx. So that's an issue, and it can be controlled by controlling various parameters of the combustion process. But right. if you can avoid combustion altogether, of course, uh, all the better. And of course, fuel cells do, do that, and at do a that. very yep. yeah, higher, much higher efficiency than any combustion right. process. And then the last one actually is a little bit of a success story in terms of showing what uh, the global community is capable of doing when it comes to uh, harmful uh, emissions uh, that are affecting uh, the global environment, and chlorinated gases. Uh, CFCs years ago were, were in a lot of uh, refrigeration systems, um, hairspray, different propellants in, in cans and so forth. And they were all phased uh, out or mostly phased out. And there's been an improvement. Ozone was the main thing people were looking at at the time, the, the attack of the ozone layer. Uh, and that has improved and recovered. And uh, so it's a little bit of, I think, a, a hopeful, a hopeful uh, example for us that uh, we can get to come together as a global community and tackle these problems. Now, now the, the, the interesting and, thing and is- of course, uh, And of course, yeah. during, uh, sorry, interrupt you. Yeah. I get to do that. Of course, during COVID, a lot of these things went way down um, and pretty rapidly. But of course, now we're kind of coming out of it, starting to ramp back up again. But it just goes to show when people stay home, work from home, and they're not spewing all this stuff out of their car exhausts, uh, things, they, the uh, actual environment snapped back pretty quickly. And they were surprised at how quickly it did. So it's very true. There's on. a lot of interrelated yeah, pieces and parts to this, moving parts. Uh, the, one of the recent, uh, I'll call it a myth, that's popped up, um, and, and I'll, I just put a bullet in there and made it as plain, plain as I can. Hydrogen is not a greenhouse gas. It, it, there, there's no question about that. Uh, there has been a lot of media attention, though, and it's been warped beyond uh, the original intent, yeah. I think, of the studies and the analysis that's been done, uh, calling it a, quote, indirect greenhouse gas. And when you start to dig into what's what what's behind all that, there's a there's a bunch of unproven hypotheses that really uh, probably 
should be looked at from a scientific research standpoint. But it basically is that if hydrogen gets into the upper atmosphere and doesn't combine somewhere else in the lower atmosphere with water or air and, and turn into uh, water, I'm sorry, in, in with, yeah, with water or air, uh, it can uh, combine with hydroxides in the upper atmosphere, which are one of the ways that uh, methane is mitigated. So there's 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 this strange kind of house of cards of of assumptions, and then at the end is, you know, you're you're you've got a circular argument that hydrogen could prevent the uh, or mi uh, the mitigation of another greenhouse gas that it's going to replace. So so uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, hyperventilating uh, headlines uh, from some outlets and, and and social media folks and some vested interests that would like you know are being challenged maybe by hydrogen coming on board and transitioning uh and you know it, it's there's it's just too early <laughs> to say anything yeah, about yeah. it that's, uh, that has any veracity so one of the things that's uh, going to make our new uh, energy economy work it has to be energy storage so let's go to the next slide and talk about how hydrogen uh, can help with, with that and some of the myths uh, involved there. Yeah, so I tried on the left. Uh, one, one of the things that people bring up is, uh, well, you know, it's it's wasteful to use renewable energy uh, to um, electrolyze water into hydrogen and then put it back into a fuel cell later uh, because of the round trip efficiencies and the loss there. Uh, the problem with that argument is that, you know, intermittent renewables uh, cannot follow electrical demand. It, it, it's a fantasy to think otherwise. You know, the sun okay. shines and the wind blows uh, uh, based on the local resources and, and, and weather and so forth. Uh, and the electrical demand is driven, of course, by what people's uh, usage is. So you have these times of uh, underutilization of your renewables uh, and then overutilization of the renewables and therefore as you get to a certain point and most studies have said that's around 30 percent on your when your regeneration uh sources are 30 percent or more renew, intermittent renewables you need to have storage in the mix or you're going to have difficulty controlling the grid the, the, the electrical right. grid around that. so uh, i just did that little sketch on the left hand side to, to show that you know when you have that over generation so when in the middle of the day when People are at work, the residential loads aren't as high, and, and you have extra energy, so to speak, extra. Uh, if you don't store it, it just gets curtailed, or in other words, not used, it's wasted, uh, or, or isn't you know, put into use of any kind. Uh, so if you use that to electrolyze water into hydrogen and oxygen, by the way, which you can use for various things, uh, then store the hydrogen. Uh, then when you have an insufficient amount of renewables, uh, you can, of course, as you know, Mitch, run through a fuel cell, and you can make up uh, some or all of that uh, um, shortfall in terms of the demand and, and the generation capacity you have. So that's the essence of it. And again, people get twisted a little bit around the efficiency part of it, and that's not really the point. The point is you need energy storage because you, you can't load follow with intermittent renewables. And I think on that slide, I had a little bit more about some of the other storage, yes, uh, options. Um, pumped hydro is one of the cheapest and most uh, you know, effective and well-developed high technology level uh, storage um, uh, approaches. That's where you take water, you pump it up to a higher elevation so you've got potential energy. And then when you need it, you run it back down through a, a, a turbine, a water turbine or some other generating uh, type of a paddle system or what have you, and you get that energy back. Uh, the problem is, uh, if you don't have the local geography, geography that supports that, you can't use it. So if, if you're in a flat area or, or you don't have uh, a land rights to, to, that you would need to have quite a bit of storage available for that water, then it's not of much use. Uh, batteries have very high efficiency, right, and good round trip efficiency. Uh, but as you start to scale, the, the cost gets, uh, uh, gets, gets to be infeasible. You, you know, there's replacement costs after they reach a certain lifetime. Uh, they're expensive to even the initial capex to, to uh, put put them in place. It's expensive, and there's you know other issues that you know you know we've got a lot of things coming online now with batteries, and they all have supply chain challenges and uh, right. you know all kinds of uh, strategic materials issues and recycling issues that are all being kind of worked out in real time. But but it's not the all, end all solution. Uh, the thing about hydrogen is it can be implemented anywhere at any scale. So. Uh, you do ha have a lower round trip efficiency than batteries, but uh, you don't have any recycling uh, concerns. You don't have supply chain issues. You don't have strategic material issues. So, you know, there's uh, always a balance with these options and which solution uh, makes the most sense. Uh, but I try to capture that at least in some of those uh, bullets. 
So you did a good job, and I can hardly wait for this next slide. It's your best one. Okay. <laughs> hey, Santa Claus. Yes, yeah, yeah, Santa Claus is helping us out here. Uh, this kind of gets back to your uh, comment early on, Mitch, that um, there seems to be this this missing uh, communication that uh, yeah, uh, a lot of uh, even official reports will talk about unavoidable boil off losses. Uh, there's no such thing anymore in liquid hydrogen. You can always avoid boil off losses by a variety of methods. And I've kind of done those sub bullets sort of in the order that you tackle them for a typical system design. You first try to do it with passive thermal design. Then you can do some liquid mixing, uh, depending on your concept of operation, that might get you to the point where you're going to consume uh, the hydrogen before you would have to vent it. Uh, and then there's vapor cooled shields. Uh, Joule Thompson cooling is a third thermodynamic technique. And then finally, uh, if you still have heat coming into your system and you have long term storage, uh, you can go to cryo refrigeration and cryo coolers. And that was the system that you mentioned that I designed for the largest operational liquid hydrogen uh, doer tank at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, and that eliminates uh, uh, all the boil off completely. So um, that's one of the things that seems to still be kind of embedded in a lot of assumptions and analysis. The other one is this idea that you have all these distribution and transportation losses. And the fact is you can do everything with hydrogen in one site, uh, you know, in one place. And I think that's what a lot of the systems, uh, certainly a lot of the ones I'm working on now are doing that. You're generating the hydrogen, you're liquefying it, you're using it all in one place. So there is no transportation or distribution. Yeah. Therefore, there, is, there are no losses. And then finally, well, I, the, the importance well, of life cycle energy and efficiency analysis is very important. You know, anytime you see you're in on one particular isolated uh, figure of merit, I think you're missing the big picture. And I'll, I'll stop there because I know this is something we could chat about for a long time. And I know we're getting close to the end. Well, we're, we got a little, few more minutes to go, but I wanted to make the point that you made to me that these cryo refrigeration coolers are basically commercial and they're not yes. that expensive in terms of how much they cost. And also they don't use that much energy to run one of these cryo coolers compared to the amount of energy you'd lose if you allowed your hydrogen to boil off and the cost of losing all that hydrogen to the cost of uh, you know paying a little bit of electricity to uh, keep your uh, Hyd your liquid hydrogen intact. Yeah, and, and that was the sort of uh, uh, e economic analysis that NASA did at Kennedy Space Center when they uh, asked for us to design that system. It was pennies on the dollars uh, to save uh, the hydrogen that they would have vented otherwise if they didn't have that cryo cooling system in place. So you're absolutely right, Mitch. It's uh, a, And again, you want to take those other steps first. They're the cheaper and easier ones to do. And sometimes that's sufficient, depending on your use rate and, and your concept of operations, you, you may not need to do uh, cryo refrigeration, but you do have that option. So now we have to hurry. I'm getting the I'm getting the hook here, <laughs> okay. and we're on our last slide. How about that? So Perfect. What about that? Yeah. Uh, I can cover this quickly. Uh, this is a mnemonic I made up uh, uh, to help people remember some of the facts. So we're getting into the facts now, and I call it the 2020 vision for the countdown to hydrogen. So the first 20 is that meters per second rise rate we already talked about. Uh, 20 degrees Kelvin is a second 20. That's the temperature of liquid hydrogen. So two facts, remember. Five safety tips with hydrogen, ventilation, leaks, ignition sources. And then if you're talking about liquid hydrogen, you're working with cryogenics and phase change. Liquid uh, gas typically is one you want to watch for. And then the countdown, uh, the next part of the countdown, four, is the number, the volume, four times the volume of uh, liquid hy hydrogen required to have the same energy as legacy fuels, but you got to remember efficiency. If your efficiency is better in a fuel cell, then you need less of the fuel. However, the same mass of hydrogen has three times the energy of, um, of legacy fuels, and that's what that scale on the left-hand side is, is trying to show. And then the two, one and zero, two is the spin states of hydrogen, which becomes important if you're working with liquid hydrogen. One proton per atom and two atoms per molecule, so that's why it's called H2 for folks that have always wondered why the, what the two is. And then zero uh, carbon emissions and no smoke, no particulates. Uh, it really is a, uh, a, 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 no, a no environmental impact when it comes to use of hydrogen. So uh, the last slide uh, tells us how we can uh, get in contact with Matt. And he has a really nice uh, website. And I might also add he has a, uh, he does, uh, he has uh, an educational program on liquid hydrogen. And he also has a blog site on LinkedIn and a ton of information because 
this is like a dead spot. It was a gap. And now everybody's flooding to that site and coming up with all sorts of new information that's really, really effective. And you did a really good job on that, Matt. Thank you. So, Thank you, Mitch. So I yeah, can't I, I welcome any anybody longer. to take a look at that. Yeah. I'm getting the hook, so I'm I got close <laughs> now. So so we've been uh we gotta leave it there. We've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii and talking the story with Matt Moran, rocket scientist, uh, managing member of Moran Innovations and a hydrogen expert as well. Today we've been talking a story about hydrogen and myths and facts, and I'm sure we're all now better informed. Thank you, Matt, for getting us right on this. Thanks for having and me. Thanks to and thanks to our viewers for tuning in. I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.